Before we get started, a word from our friends at Keeley Companies. In the words of Keeley Companies CEO, Rusty Keeley, when it comes down to it, there are two things that make Keeley Companies incredible, people and process. The strategic growth model called the Keeley Way ensures that Keeley achieves results on purpose. Including five-year visions, scorecards, meaningful action plans, the Keeley Way allows Keelians to turn dreams into reality and drives goals to realize visions. Because of this relentless focus on people and culture, Keeley Companies has experienced explosive growth that shows no signs of slowing down. Learn more at KeeleyCompanies.com. And one more thing. 2020 has been tough, and many are sharing that the number one national best-selling book is called In Awe, is the exact message of hope, of wonder, and of the pursuit of joy that is needed right now. It's perfect for your friends, for your family, for your clients, for your colleagues, and yes, indeed, for yourself. Why not finish your holiday shopping, get your Christmas shopping done, stuff those stockings right now by grabbing an extra 50% off when you order 10 copies or more. You can get your copies today at JohnO'LearyInspires.com. Place them by December 14th and they should arrive by Christmas. So my friends, go ahead, visit me today at JohnO'LearyInspires.com. Grab your copies of In Awe or On Fire or some other goodies you'll find in this shop. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. If you are at all like me, you probably listen to your fair share of TED Talks. And if you're at all like me, you probably wondered sometimes when the presenter is presenting, Is there even an audience live in front of them? There's very seldom interaction. There's very seldom laughter. There's very seldom emotion shown by the audience themselves. That's frequently the case, but it's not the case with our guest today. I was watching Julie's presentation in front of her TED community recently. And one of the things I noticed is frequently when Julie would make a point, the audience would gasp. Uh, As they moved back toward the audience, you would see people wiping their tears. As you would see Julie making points, you'd see them laughing and moving and sometimes applauding with joy and confidence that the work she did mattered, that she's making a difference and they were with her along the way. And maybe one of the coolest things I saw during Julie's conversation was at the end of it, and this is very rare for Ted, at the end of it, the audience rose and gave her and her organization and the work they do a rousing standing ovation. I wanted to share that ovation. I wanted to share that energy and I wanted to share that story with you today. It's an amazing story. It's a tragic story. It's one that far too frequently has been in in the shadows. But today with Julie's help, it comes back into the light. So my friends, I invite you strongly right now to grab a cup of coffee, (laughs) grab a water or something even stronger than that. Grab a box of handkerchiefs, grab a nearby friend, a journal, and a pen to take some notes. You'll want to take notes on this one, as I have the honor and the privilege of introducing you to my friend, and her name is Julie Cordua. Julie, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. That was, um, you just generated a bunch of uh, butterflies in my tummy (laughs) remembering that moment, but thanks for having me. And we're going to relive it a bunch as we converse together. And Julie, I, I, I whispered and hinted a little bit of, about the work you do. And when someone says, hey, John, what do you do? I always let them know I'm a dad and I'm a speaker and a writer. Uh, I'm a coach and a podcast host. And when my wife answers, she's a mom and a wife. And she's an occupational therapist working with kids with special needs. When you see someone you're meeting for the first time and they say, Julie, what do you do? How do you respond? I'm on a mission to end online child sexual abuse. Um, And I uh, do that through my work in Thorn, uh, which is an organization. We focus specifically on building technology to end the trade of online child sexual abuse, but 
really it's about changing um, the global systems that respond to this issue and creating a safer world for our kids. So this is the topic that you and I will be discussing primarily today. And as you and I were talking before we hit record, you said, John, I, I, I want everybody to recognize, like, I didn't see this in my future. I, I, I could have never imagined as a young girl growing up in her, my, my first couple <laughs> jobs that I would be on the front side of this global movement. So I thought what would be really cool is if rather than jumping right into Thorn and the life-changing work you're doing there, let's back up. Let's back up to your experiences leading up to it, including your childhood. Would, would you share some of the influences from your childhood that has led you forward along the journey? I grew up in a very small town, kind of a farming community. So it was the kind of where you run around outside and <laughs> until dark uh, and um, you're out in nature a lot. Um, I think what that led to was uh, just a lot of independence. And also for me, a focus on always believing that there was a bigger world out there that I needed to see. And so I had a very also strong mom who raised me to be very strong and independent. Uh, and so when I did, did leave that community when I was 18, um, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew that there was this big world that uh, I wanted to be a part of. Um, and so that led to just wanting to travel. Um, I, you know, get my education and as I expanded my view of the world, really seeing, uh, not just, you know, how I could be successful, but realizing that, um, I could use whatever I was learning to, um, make a bigger impact beyond myself, I guess. Um, and that was rooted back in some of the things I did see growing up. So um, again, I grew up in a, in a pretty rural community. Um, there was poverty. Um, there was chances where you definitely had to help your neighbor. We, will, we were all one community. And I think that that just really shaped how I looked at the world that uh, when you look around and you see where's the most vulnerable and how do I use what I have and my resources to make that most vulnerable person experience a more equitable and better life, how can I do that? You worked after school for Motorola, you helped launch Razor, you did a whole lot of other really cool things. Then you step in with Red. For the folks who may not somehow be familiar with it, would you, would you tell us a little bit about the work that you collectively did with RED? Yeah, so that was, that was unexpected. I, like you said, I, um, when I left college uh, and, I, and I got my graduate degree, I thought I'd be in business, in marketing. I ended up in technology and wireless technology at the time. Um, and then I got a phone call one day from Bobby Shriver. And he said, um, you know, someone gave me your number. I want you to come help us launch this thing called Red. And I said, uh, what, what is this? Well, we're going to get some of the biggest companies in the world to give us half their profits to buy AIDS medicine in Africa. And we're also going to get them to give their best marketers to this cause and make sure that the world knows that regardless of where you're born, you should have equal access to AIDS medicine. And I said, I just worked at one of those big companies at Motorola. They're not going to give you 50% of their profit. There's no way. Um, and this was before Red was launched. He was explaining the concept. And I talked to him for um, about six months and a, a few other folks who are helping, helping shape it. Um, and, and I bought in. And his, his pitch, which leads to Thorne, actually was, we want to put the best and brightest minds in the private sector to work on behalf of some of the world's most vulnerable people. And when it came to Red, that was about how do you get the world's best marketers, the people who market Gap, the people who market Apple, the people who market Motorola, to raise awareness about AIDS. And that was what we did at Red. 
It was about putting these companies to work um, and their marketing budgets to work on behalf of people in the developing world who did not have access to AIDS medicine simply because they could not afford it. And um, in doing that, in our first five years, I think we raised in those first five years nearly $300 million. And they've gone on to raise more than half a billion dollars. Um, but that was almost a, a huge learning moment for me um, and a pretty awesome ride to realize what you can do when you merge uh, kind of the talents of the private sector with mission-driven work. When you are partnering with you two, at some of the biggest marketers around the world and you're raising hundreds of millions of dollars and you're, you're seeing an immediate impact through your efforts. It's easy, I would imagine, for our listeners and for me to see that as, uh, wow, what a terrific story. I would also imagine, though, that in the midst of that incredible growth, that there were some really disappointing realities that became so evident to you. So uh, what, what were some of the realities that you began to realize, gosh, we're doing great work Oh, but this thing still remains in front of us. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the scale of that problem, the scale, I mean, this is something also that we, we right. focus in red is just the sheer, sheer scale of some of the these big global issues is um, Eventually, in the work we were doing, the cost of antiretrovirals was reduced to about, I think it was 20 cents a day. But then you have to look at, okay, we can get the cost down, we can raise the money, we can buy it, but there are tens of millions of people who need it, some in the most remote areas on earth. So how do you go from solving some of these bigger kind of structural issues to, to just distribution and, and reaching everyone um, that you need to. And so I think sometimes what can happen when you're working on these big social issues is being overwhelmed a bit by the sheer yeah. scale. And so then you have to remind yourself to come back down to, are you changing the systems that will create long-term uh, positive change in whatever you're trying to address. And then you have to focus on the individual. Have I changed a life? Am I changing 10 lives? Um, am I incrementally making things better? Because sometimes that, that scale can just be um, a bit overwhelming. When, when you struggle personally with, the, with this kind of scale, whether it's at Red or with the job that you are currently leading now, what do you do? Well, like, what, what are your practices that keep you grounded or humble or faithful or looking up when it feels like the entire world is crushing you down? I go back to trying to bring it back down to one story. One of our board members at Thorne was the founding CEO of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And he's worked on this issue of um, exploited children for multiple decades. And I asked him that recently of you have been in this field for so long and it can be overwhelming yeah. and it can be hard. And, and how do you focus on um, staying positive? And uh, he said, um, I, I always focus on, you know, the individual. Am I changing one individual's life? Um, and we, at Thorne, we have in our Slack, we have a wins channel. And we, we, we often focus on the big shifts, right? You know, the hundreds of thousands of images we've helped scan or this. But what we really try to put in there is the stories of the children who've been removed from harm or the, the one case that we helped solve or the one perpetrator that we've removed from being able to harm children because that when you get overwhelmed in the sheer scale or you feel like you're in a bit of quicksand <laughs> because so much is moving, if you can tie back to one human, um, because for me, I, I tend to sit and think about uh, that person and it's more than just removing them from harm. You have created an opening in their life where their entire um, path forward can be changed. 
Mm. Um, and what they can go on to do because of this moment in time is totally different than what they could have been able to do prior to that. So as you and I have this conversation behind me is a wall of my family members. So I have four children, I'm married, my parents are up there, five siblings, grandparents. Behind this camera are all the guests that we've had the honor of interviewing. Your picture will be up there soon, Ms. Julie, uh, honor, and I'm grateful for it. But to the right are individuals throughout history who have made profound global change. And one of the things I think that combines and, you, and unites all of them is the, the focus was not on changing the world. It was on changing one life. Can, can I do it once? Can I love one orphan? Can I get one kid out of the situation? And in doing that well, faithfully over time, not only does that one life change, but you can scale it. So it, it leads us now from red into what you're currently doing with Thorne. How were you introduced to Thorne? Well, so I was actually introduced to our founders nine years ago, I think. <laughs> it's kind what of a, a- Tell us who the founders were. You can go ahead and name drop for a moment. <laughs> yeah, so it's an interesting interesting story. I um, was working at Red. I'd been there about five years. Um, and I, I think I was, I had just had my second child. And I was living in LA, but I was traveling, traveling to New York two weeks out of every month. And that is exhausting. As a new mother, I was taking the babies with me. Um, and <laughs> so up all night in a hotel room with kids and then going to work all day and flying cross country. And I thought, you know what, I got to change this. I need to be closer to home. And so a friend of mine in Los Angeles said, well, you really should meet, um, they were working with Ashton Kutcher and they said, you should meet Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore. They are starting their philanthropic journey and they are um, going to start an organization focused on combating child sex trafficking. And you should just go meet them given your background and see. So I had a conversation with them and I knew nothing about child sex trafficking. I knew nothing about online child sexual abuse. Um, but when I met with them, my experience in the conversation was very similar to the experience I had had five years earlier with Bobby Shriver and uh, the team at Red, where they had um, an area they were passionate about. They had identified a significant gap, which was the role of technology in addressing um, online child sexual abuse. They were deeply committed to it, and they wanted to create something new that would work on behalf of these children and completely change the game for these um, kids. And so I, I joined them at that time. And something I was incredibly lucky to experience that um, I don't think many nonprofit leaders may get the opportunity to do or to have is that um, they said, you know, I came in and I said, I know how to start an organization. I know how to work on technology. I don't know anything about this field. I need to learn. Yes. And they said, great. Um, I think it was about really 10 to 12 months where they said, go out and learn and then let's come back and figure out what we're gonna do. And so in that first year, I, I kept names of everyone I spoke to. I went out around the world and talked to about 150 different people involved in this field to just really understand what the different dynamics were and what was needed. I talked to survivors, I talked to law enforcement, I talked to tech companies, I talked to NGOs, and really it was a huge learning mission for me. And even today, I still feel like I'm learning a ton, but that year was the foundation of creating Thorn. So Julie, you're talking about something I think most of us have heard of. And if we're honest about it, most of us think it's, um it's really not an issue that affects us, probably anybody we know, or probably anybody even in our city. Uh, it's just not an issue that it, that's affects us. Well, it's tragic, it's horrible, but is it really that common? And I think that's the perspective so many folks have on this, and yet yours is, is educated and quite different than that. Would you tell us what a profound problem this is? Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you the numbers, and I will, but I think what has brought that to life more than anything is um, when I go out and speak now over the last few years, 
every single place I go, um, someone will come up and disclose their abuse to me. And they feel a connection because they know I understand uh, what um, they've experienced uh, and can respect their experience and, and where they're at. What has been even more um, surprising to me is we work specifically on online child sexual abuse. So the spread of the documentation of the abuse of a child, images and videos, or live streaming abuse. And I know that child sexual abuse happens everywhere across this country and everywhere across the world. It does not discriminate. Um, it happens in homes, um, in, in all communities. But the number of people who have also been victims of um, the documentation of that abuse is, is extraordinary and how close it is when I am in any type of venue that someone comes up and says, I was a victim not only of child sexual abuse or I'm a survivor, um, but also uh, I know it's documented and I know it's still on the internet today. Um, and so that to me was just so eye-opening because those are people who a lot of us don't think it's in our neighborhoods or we don't think it's in our community because that's not a dinner conversation you have. That's not the kind of thing that you talk to your friends about. You don't want to often share that. Uh, but when you've created a safe environment for people to talk about it, um, it surfaces and it surfaces in, in almost any community that you're in. As far as the numbers behind it, I, again, we're looking at the spread of child sexual abuse material online and legally it's called child pornography. You're not gonna hear me say that term because pornography is one thing. The documentation of the violent assault of a child is something very different. And so we call it child sexual abuse material. But in the US alone last year, uh, in 2019, there were 69 million files of child sexual abuse material reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. So when I say reported, the way this works in our country is that if any tech company comes across this material, they have to document it and report it to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children so it can be investigated but you've only got a handful of companies that actually proactively look for this material. So 69 million files from a small number of companies when we know there's actually hundreds of companies that host images and videos and should be looking. Um, there's a lot more out there that uh, we don't even know about yet. I've been preparing for today for weeks and thinking about today for months. And every time I think about the work you do, my heart aches. I almost start crying and I can't imagine the agony that these little ones are in, that their families are in, that you and your team are in as you're going through these images, trying to track them, trying to bring them down, trying to get them to the right authorities to, to bring about justice. And so um, I'm a little lost for words right now, but I, I think where I'd like to take this conversation what do you see when you when you say gosh we have almost 70 million images and videos last year alone and john it is the tip of the iceberg man this is the the very tippity top of the top of the iceberg what are you doing at thorn to begin then shaving down that iceberg to get to the root and eventually eradicate this thing so that's our goal that, that's what i going back to where we started today that's what i stood up on the ted stage and said is that we have this goal of eliminating the trade of child sexual abuse um, material online. And uh, we think it can be done. Uh, I think one of my last lines was, it's not gonna be easy, but it's not impossible. Uh, and I firmly believe that. It's, it's just gonna take a lot more than us is, is the thing. Um, so a couple things. One is uh, we've got to be able to find the children in these images faster and stop their abuse. So 
you know, there are instances where these kids, their abuse is being broadcast to the world for years and law enforcement doesn't even know they're out there until they maybe stumble across an image of a new abuse, um, of, of new abuse, and then they start an investigation. And then it can take so long to find the child that it's another year where that child's being abused, but the images and videos are circulating. And so what one thing that we're doing is we're building better software for law enforcement so that they have all the intelligence at their fingertips as quickly as possible um, to identify the children. And that's the first step one, because we're reducing the harm to the child more quickly, but two, it gets perpetrators out of society if they're right. abusing uh, kids. So we remove the kid from harm, we get the perpetrator out, we stop the production of this type of material. The fact that images and videos can be published on platforms and then go viral for years simply because private sector platforms aren't prioritizing stopping the viral spread of this is egregious, I think. And so our position is that every single company that hosts images and videos needs to proactively be detecting this material and one, taking it down if it's already on their platform, but two, just stopping it from ever being uploaded. And that's not that hard. <laughs> and the software exists to do it. And so whether a company chooses to build their own software to, to do this, great. Or that's another area that we've built software to, to make this happen. Um, but if you're, if a company is hosting images and videos and not doing this work, they're turning a blind eye. So, so they're knowingly, from my perspective, um, enabling the abuse of these children and, uh, that has to stop. And then the third, third focus for us, you know, first is find the child. Second is stop the viral spread of the content. And third is, um, unfortunately, one of the fastest growing areas of um, child sexual abuse material online today is self-generated material from kids. And so there's a whole other area of work that needs to be changing the conversation with our children. Um, so the self-generated material can happen in a variety of ways. It can happen between a child and someone they trust and they're sending naked images of themselves. It can happen because that child's being groomed online by a perpetrator who uh, essentially extorts them for worse and worse images. And then there's also the situation of um, there's a type of abuse now where uh, abuse is being live streamed. Um, perhaps people paying in from a more privileged part of the world to perhaps um, a developing part of the world where people will actually pay for someone to live stream abuse online. And then that is captured and turned into images and videos. So that entire area of work of stemming the tide of self-generated content um, is, is a new and emerging focus for us too. In preparing again for today's conversation, one of the things that amazes me most is that the market for these videos and these pictures is as robust as it is. And it's important, I think, people recognize that um, in addition to talking about 17-year-olds and 16-year-olds, You've said before, John, about 60% of the images we're referring to this iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, 60% are 12 and under. These are, these are babies who are being exploited and abused. As you, as you reflect on that, um, what is the cause of this evil? Like, I'm just amazed that the market is so massive that there are these, this many individuals that desire that kind of abuse. I think that's a really important question because um, in this work, because that abuse is so um, horrific, it's easy to just group all of the perpetrators in one bucket and just say, we have to do away with a certain population. But it's more important to understand why, which is the question you're asking. What's driving this abuse? What's driving this demand? Because we have to understand that in order to end this. And so mm. 
there's varying levels of research uh, that, and, and to be honest, there needs to be more. It's not a very attractive place to fund research, right? It's like, why is someone abusing a child? Uh, but we have to, in order to, to get to the heart of it and understand it. And so some of the research that we've reviewed um, identifies a couple different motivations. So there's, there's one motivation that is, you know, a clinical issue of someone has an attraction to a child, right? And, and that is a clinical issue that uh, needs to be identified and, and dealt with in one, in one way. Um, but there's also evidence that says there's some types of personalities that may uh, kind of seek out this type of destructive behavior and so so could be grouped with other forms of destructive behavior like addiction to drugs or addiction to alcohol or addiction to other things. And this is just another form of destructive behavior. There's also some uh, research that shows that it could be a um, type of slippery slope addiction to online pornography. So you start one place and you keep going for more and more egregious content and you get into this type of content. Um, and then there's, there's also something to the fact that what the internet allows us to do is normalize almost anything. Correct. So we, we have seen this, we're seeing this right now in many other parts of our society, right? Is that you have a little inkling or you're interested in something, um, whether it be a conspiracy theory or a certain belief system or something, and you can on the internet really quickly go down a rabbit hole and you can find other people who tell you it's okay and tell you that's normal and really normalize behavior that may not be the best behavior. Yeah. And that happens in this area as well. There are entire chat rooms and entire groups of people who talk about abusing kids and telling people it's okay. And even sharing manuals of how to abuse children. And that is where, when we look at our mission, why we're so focused on the role the internet is playing in child sexual abuse and creating interventions there to try to um, essentially destroy this kind of economy of child sexual abuse online, destroy the communities, not make it normal. Um, but it's a constant, it's a constant battle. It is a battle. It's a battle worth having, but it's a constant battle and it must feel like there are days uh, that the others are uh, advancing forward towards you. So uh, as you push back, as you fight back, as you claim some victories, I wanted to first talk about the big numbers and then talk about a really small number. But what are some of the bigger numbers that you can celebrate? What, what is Thorne doing proactively and productively to push back this tide of, of evil? In our work, we, we look at a couple different things. So we look at you know, how many children are we able to identify? Again, going back to what I said earlier, of just every one of those children now has a different chance at life, right? There's a lot that's going to go into their rehabilitation, but they're ideally poised for, yeah, rehabilitating and, and having a, a, better, a better path. Um, but that's over 10,000 children that we've been able to identify through our work in child sex trafficking in eliminating uh, child sexual abuse material. We are working with tech platforms. We've already been able to identify, that's just new work in this last year, over 100,000 abuse images that we've been able to take down and report. And I think, I know you wanna talk about the big numbers, but um, when, I, when I look at that 100,000, <laughs> oftentimes that image will lead to an account of someone who has hundreds more images in it that maybe we didn't catch. And in those images are often children who are being abused right now. And it's that clue that we caught that leads to the account that then leads to the child. And seeing that kind of sequential impact um, is really gratifying. Uh, and knowing that these big numbers yes. lead to individuals over time. So 
on our team meetings. We have a kickoff meeting every Monday morning at uh, 930. And we all spin around and everybody shares a mission moment. It's a, it's a moment from the previous seven days when we realized through an individual conversation, an individual human being, that the work we did here wasn't just like macroeconomics. It wasn't just big out there, big numbers, but had a direct impact on one life. Mm-hmm. And that, that is always what motivates us to keep doing the work that we do here at Live Inspired. Is there a story without using a name when you have had an opportunity to be connected with someone who you're programming, your programmers, your engineer, your fundraising, your network that you have in one way or another helped save? We don't connect directly with uh, those individuals. We often get uh, the written stories and, but it, the, in this work, often those children really need to be able to um, recreate their lives without yeah. having to um, connect with the process that helped uh, rescue them mm-hmm. so, or, or identify them. Having said that, uh, I have connected with folks who have either families who've reached out to me and said, um, maybe they don't know if our software helped identify them or our software is a part of their case, but they say like the work that you're doing is the reason why I'm able to not be in that life or in that situation today. Mm-hmm. And, and watching them, you know, grow up, get married, have their own kids, um, fulfill their dreams is, is really incredibly gratifying. You mentioned John earlier in my, my career, earlier in my life, I was globe trotting from California to New, to New York with two little ones in my pocket on the way to a very busy, heavy job. So you have your own kids, you have skin in the game. You, you care deeply, not only about the global issue, but about the personal issue. What are some things that you specifically do, whether it's as a mom or an aunt or just an advocate that would allow other parents, you know, a whole lot of our listeners are moms and dads and aunties and uncles and neighbors and grannies that we might utilize, we might be aware of to help keep our kids safe. Uh, I have very factual, open conversations about very uncomfortable topics. Uh, So, um, I talked about how the fastest growing portion of online child sexual abuse material is self-generated. And that comes oftentimes either from, again, consensual relationships where something goes south and someone shared an image and then it gets blasted out to an entire school or from someone being groomed online because they think they met a boyfriend and that boyfriend convinces them to send pictures and then extorts them for more. Um, this is happening at, you know, nine, 10, 11 year, years old. Uh, and that is an age where often we don't wanna have uncomfortable conversations. Perhaps we don't even know how to have a conversation about how to safely use your iPad, let alone sex ed. (laughs) And so the world we live in, those two conversations about sexuality and how you use your your device are not separate. We have to realize we're in a new world where children are exploring their sexuality with a device in their hand. And because of that device being a portal to the world, they have access to more information than ever before. And so we actually have um, a website called Stop Sextortion. Um, and on it, we give some of these tips to parents. But what we're trying to do is just normalize the conversation around these things. And so uh, I talk to my kids, you know, if they get on a um, app or uh, something else about you know, the types of uncomfortable texts they could get, or what, what would you do if this happened? And at first it's, you know, laughs like that would never happen. Who would ever ask for that? And, and I'll say, well, someone might, and what would you do? Just let's have a game plan. How, how would you handle that? Um, and so it's less about um, fear or ignoring that the risks aren't there and more recognizing we live in a world where there are risks. 
How do we create resilience in our children to give them the tools they need to um, be, be more resilient in the face of, of a potential, potential threat? And that a part of me, my heart breaks to have to say that because you want to just hold on to their childhood. But holding on to their childhood may mean just equipping them to operate in the world that we live in, um, in, in kind of a, you know, face some of these risks head on. Julie, you, you mentioned in your TED talk that about 20 years ago, this this sexual exploitation of children was almost eradicated. It, we almost had it, the thing gone. It was unsafe for the perpetrators to send it through the mail. And so it was beginning to fade, which was uh, the right move as a society. And then with the advent of technology, of course, it's blossomed. And you mentioned last year, 65 million plus images, just the tip of the iceberg. So as you look forward, and it's going to be kind of a broad question, I'll let you speak as much time as you need. But as you look forward, are you optimistic that we are beginning to to get at the core, get at the root? Uh, I am, and I anchor it in something else I'm seeing. So 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, advent of the internet, uh, there's this huge shift in our society, right? We're going through this uh, entire evolution where the internet will change every aspect of our society. And we didn't think about the most vulnerable mm. when that transformation happened. So we thought about the huge potential it has for our lives, the world, our economy, our society, which is great. There has been um, a lot of good that this evolution has had for us um, and our society. But by purposefully, uh, maybe not purposely, just not recognizing the impact on our most vulnerable, we, ignore, we allowed this um, epidemic to be created. And we didn't think about children in, in this evolution of technology. And so I feel like right now as a society, we are reckoning with what technology has meant for our most vulnerable, not just for our kids, but uh, around the world in a lot of different situations. And so I think on a macro level, we are entering another phase of this evolution, which is really understanding not just the upside, but the potential downside and building to mitigate that risk. And so when I think about our role and the role of combating child sexual abuse online in that bigger you know, shift, I am optimistic because I think people are recognizing um, that there are silent victims of this evolution, which for us, that's how I feel like. I feel like I'm speaking for kids who can't speak for themselves. Like you said, many of these children literally can't speak for themselves because they're too little. They can't speak yet. And then second, what you said earlier about have I met many of them? That, that's not, I don't feel like that's my right because they need their privacy back. Their entire, the worst parts of their life have been broadcast to the world. And, and it's my job now to take that back for them and let them quietly go off and recreate a life that the rest of the world doesn't have access to. And, um, and so if I think about my role in this next evolution, it is leaning into this momentum of are the builders, are those that are creating the internet and the, the systems recognizing what the impact on the most vulnerable is and building to mitigate that. And, and my job is to make sure that these kids have a voice at that mm -hmm. table. The builders, I know that's a term you use a lot. It's a beautiful term, this idea of, of building something even better tomorrow than we had yesterday. And, uh, and then grabbing arm in arm with those around us who would do likewise to make this world truly, I know it sounds idealistic, but it's possible to make the world truly a better place tomorrow than it was yesterday. For you, dealing with not only a difficult interview, the, the last 45 minutes you and I have had the honor of hanging out together talking about a worthy topic, it's so heavy. Like, uh, I, you know, I, I need to take a walk around the block. I would imagine our listeners do. And you go from this conversation into the next, and then into the next, and then you whiteboard it out, and then you talk to the engineers, and then you talk to, it, it, it's constant chronic, it's got to weigh you down. And then you leave work and you come home and you're a busy mom. 
it's a divisive political season. There's recession, recessionary winds. We've all been through abuse and challenges in our lives. We've all got a lot of difficulties we face. Speak to those of us, including yourself from days, from time to time on how we have the opportunity even still in spite of what we've been through to take a better step forward. That, that our past doesn't have to define where we go next. So give us a little bit of encouragement as we pivot out of a conversation into the Live Inspired 7. I think you just said it, right? I, it, it's taking every day um, as a new day and purposefully focusing on the potential. Um, I think something I've had to get really comfortable with in not only dealing with this issue, but in building an organization and <laughs> being a mom and um, being a human in 2020 is um, not everything's gonna be perfect. And how we will be able to move forward is being totally comfortable with things not being perfect. Um, and kind of looking at things and saying, wow, I really screwed that up. Or, wow, that hurts. That, that's hard. Um, I'm gonna sit here and cry for a little bit. But I know that this is a moment in time and I know that tomorrow's gonna be better. And I know that uh, there's upside and there's potential for where we're headed. Uh, but I think I've had to learn to give myself the grace of messing up, of sadness, uh, of fear. So at our, at our organization, we um, went through this exercise of you know, creating cultural values. And at one point we were gonna have one that said fearless. Hmm. And we, uh, we actually changed it to say unstoppable. And my perspective on it was, I'm scared a lot of the time, but I'm not gonna stop. Uh, and, and I think that that is just what kind of keeps, keeps me going is it's okay to be scared, it's okay to be sad, it's okay to feel like you don't really know what you're doing. Um, it's the forward momentum, I think that counts that you're not willing to give up and you're willing to keep going. I have a little boy named Henry William O'Leary, and he is terrified of practice, or at least he used to be when he was a little boy, like ball practice. And I could see one time on the way to this practice that he again was just looking out the window and all stuck up in his anxieties. And so I said, Henry, are you okay? And he said, Daddy, yeah, I'm okay. I'm just scared. I'm just scared. Once I get out of the car and go, I'm all right. But, go, but going is always the scary part. And I think what that little blonde haired boy reminds us is, yeah, life is scary. I, I don't believe in the tattoo, no fear. I think that's nonsense. It's reckless. We ought to have fear all the time, but we can use it to harness it in a direction that will not only allow us to do something brave for ourselves, but allow us to do something significant for those that we are called to serve. Julie, you are living proof of what is possible when you make your life about something bigger than yourself. Um, and, and you do it so brilliantly, so beautifully. And so I wanna wrap up the conversation today uh, with what we call the Live Inspired Seven. They are seven questions that tether all of our wonderful guests together and you now fit into that mold beautifully. Question number one is what is the best book? What is the best book you've ever read? I read this one a couple of years ago that I really, really loved. It was the Book of Joy. It was the Dalai Lama and Archbishop uh, Tutu mm -hmm. talking about joy. What's the main takeaway from the book of joy? It's within. It's a lot of what we just talked about. It's really? focused. Don't look externally for your joy. Look internally for your joy. And it's your, um, it's your perspective on life and everything you experience. Julie, what's one positive characteristic or one trait that you possessed as a little girl uh, that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? I think I was a little more of a daredevil back then. I'd still have a little bit of it, but I'd like to be a little bit more uh, of a daredevil. You know, a, a mom taking the red eye with one kid in this arm, one kid in this arm, <laughs> and you two rocking them forward to live into the VP of global marketing. <laughs> Babe, you got some fearlessness. You got some daredevil <laughs> somewhere inside you. I'm pretty convinced of that. 
if your home caught fire and your children and your animals, your spouse, your partner, you, everybody's out safe and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, just one thing that matters to you, what would you grab? You know, someone asked me this the other day under some other circumstances. Um, I don't know if this is a good or a bad answer, but there's nothing. If I'm with my family, I'm not quite sure what else I need. If you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous beach on a perfect day with anybody, living or dead, who would you want to be seated right next to? So my grandfather on my mom's side uh, was a really cool guy. And he passed before I was old enough to really under, like ask him about his life. And uh, he just always had lessons for mm. us. Uh, and I wish I understood more of what went behind him having all that knowledge. And I'd really love to sit with him. You know what? Life in part. Global recessions and depressions and world wars and famines and, and pandemics. And if you're paying attention, rather than just trying to cancel it out, you recognize that you are being shaped and you are gaining in wisdom. And I bet your grandfather had a lot of that to the years he spent on earth. Uh, yes. What a, what a blessing. So what, what was the best advice that your grandfather or anybody else you respect ever gave you? That, uh, there's kind of two, two pieces of advice that are similar and it speaks to kind of the persistence um, and resiliency that we talked about before. One is the only way to the other side is through. Uh, and, and so, you know, every time I feel I'm in a very difficult position, Again, I just recognize it, realize I'm in it, realize I got to keep going because there is another side. Um, and then one of my very best friends <laughs> said this when I had my first child uh, and, you know, we had a text string going of everyone about phases that our kids were going through and she had had kids a little before and she said, just remember, everything is a phase. It might be a one day phase or it might be a five year phase, but everything is a phase. And I've extrapolated that advice to every part of my life that um, again, you know, be grateful for where we're at, good or bad, because one of the constants in our life is change. And that, so that, that advice can kind of apply to your children. It can apply to where you're at in your work and it can apply to how you're feeling personally, your relationships, but recognizing this fluidity in life, being grateful for where we're at and knowing there's something else that's coming, um, I think is something that I keep in perspective. Mm. What advice would you offer your 20 year old self? If you could go back in time, pre- current work, pre-Thorn, pre-Motorola, pre kellogg and whisper some advice to your 20-year-old self. What would you say? Take more risks based on, is that, do, do, do you catch a theme now? Um, <laughs> take, take more risks, I think, based on your principles. I think coming from a small town and then going out into the world, I was, there. that was a place where I was, I think in my early years, uh, pretty, um, focus just on survival. Like, can I make it in this big world? And so I did a lot of traditional things, right? I got my graduate degree. I took the big job. I did da, da. And I'm very grateful that kind of 10 years into that, I got this opportunity to then follow my passion in mission-driven work. Um, and I would just say, you know, I'm not going to look back and regret anything because my path has led me here. And everything mm -hmm. that I learned through every one of those experiences has delivered where I'm at today. But uh, who knows, I, if I had taken maybe more risks in those early days and not been so kind of focused on just survival, I'm not sure if my life would be a little bit different. Yeah. Julie Cordua, it has been said that all great people, and I am on the phone with one right now, can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? She loved deeply and worked hard to make the world a better place. Julie Corda, you did indeed love deeply and worked wildly hard to make the world a far better place. And we're glad that you are part of it. For those who want to learn more about you and the work that you do, where can we, uh, where can we learn more? Uh, Thorn.org.
So please come there. Um, everyone has a role to play in uh, ending online child sexual abuse. And we would love for everyone to be a part of the fight. Julie, thanks for being part of the fight. My friends, that is Julie Cordoid. You can learn more at her organization, Thorn. I strongly encourage you to learn more about this pandemic that is affecting lives all over the world, including in your own backyard. So be aware of it, learn more, make yourself educated, and then make sure your friends and family members are aware as well. Julie, I wanna thank you again for making this your life's work. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, and this was fun. My friends, for this time, and until next time, my name is John O'Leary, that is Julie Cordua, and this is your day, Live Inspired. And now, a word from our friends at Keeley Companies. What started in 1976 as a local paving company has grown into a national provider of construction, infrastructure, wireless, technology, development, and logistic solutions. Over four decades and 1,800 Keelians later, Keeley Companies' roots still guide them. In the words of their founder, Larry Keeley, quality and service never go out of style. 